Hello, thanks for coming to our talk about embracing container standards in Cloud Foundry. This is a joint talk of three open source Cloud Foundry teams. My name is Kostadinos Karaboyas. I'm working for Swisscom and I'm a remote member of Cloud of Garden team located in London. Here with me. Uh, hi, I'm George Lestaris. I'm a product manager working for Pivotal. I work for the Garden Root File System team or GrootFS. Hi, I'm Gabriel Rosenhaus. I'm an engineer at Pivotal. I work on the routing team, previously the container networking team, and I'm a CNI maintainer. Okay, we will start with a short introduction to how containers are being used in Cloud Foundry. We are going then to speak about the situation before standards, what were the pain points. Then we are going to discuss, we are going team by team and discuss which standard each team adopted and how the team changed. And finally, we are going to conclude with what we have gained and enabled in platform level. So, from users to containers. User processes are running inside the containers in Cloud Foundry. The process under hood is the following. When a user does a CF push, the CLI talks to the Cloud Controller, which in turn asks from the Diego Brain to schedule a long-running process. Diego Brain is speaking a cell inside the cluster and plays this request. Locally, in a cell, there is another Diego component, which is called rep, and picks up this request. And instructs Garden to create a container which finally is going to host the user process. In high level, in order to create a container, we need a couple of stuff. First, we need an isolated container file system. We then need a kind of configuration file that is called runtime spec in container terminology. Then we're going to invoke a runtime engine which will take this to and will create the container environment. We should make sure also the networking part is there, the connectivity is there. And finally, we are going to start the user process. In the past, after 2012, before 2015, containers start being adopted heavily. Almost all companies across all industries start experimenting with containers. The reason was because they have a huge benefit in both uh, developers and operators. They have great performance, they are very portable, they have optimal resource management, and many, many other advantages. Docker allowed people to start experimenting with this old technology. And I'm saying old because container technology was more or less clear since 2008. It is an isolated process that runs using some kernel features like namespace, C groups, another security improvement, like capabilities and second. So the situation was, from the one side, there were very strong incentives to put as fast as possible containers to production. And from the other side, it was clear how to create the containers. But the problematic part was the software that spin up the container. There were not many implementations out there, and the implementations were not open, they were not standardized. So each company that wanted to adapt containers had a couple of solutions. Either to write from scratch a such software, but with high cost, or to use a non-standard implementation and basically to opt in for a vendor lock-in. That was one of the reasons why containers did not go faster in production systems. Cloud Foundry, of course, picked the first solution. A team in London was spin up called Garden that maintains a component that was was called back then Garden Linux. From the one side, Garden Linux implements the Garden API that speaks to the rest of the Cloud Foundry component. And from the other side, implements all the functions that are required in order to spin up a container. This component was large because it has a lot of functionality, built-in runtime, networking, file system. And it was very complicated because it was interacting with the kernel. And this has been always a tricky part in software engineering. So without standards, we were very busy in maintaining this component. We were very busy in patching this component. When there was a security vulnerability, it had to be patched instantly and without no external help. On top, other tasks like porting to Windows were hard because we could not actually reuse the code. 
from an engineering perspective, inside the team there was not a lot of room for innovation and creative work. Of course, this problem was not only Cloud Foundry, but many other companies were facing exactly the exact same problem. That's why Open Container Initiative was funding OCI. The mission is to standardize the container technology and make it not vendor specific. It was founded in June 2015 by Docker and 40 other members. It's a Linux Foundation collaborative project. It started with a runtime specification. Well, runtime is the, defines the life cycle of a container, how you start, you delete, you kill a container, and the environment, namespaces, volumes, networking. After two years, in June, it came to the first stable version. Uh, RunC is one other, is the reference implementation of the runtime specification that was donated by Docker. Here is also the GitHub repository if you would like to get some more information. So Garden Team uh, saw the benefit of using this OCI standard and was one of the early adapters. The architecture changed. From Garden Linux, we renamed the component to Garden Run C and we delegate a large part of the component to this external reference implementation. So the component became smaller and more flexible. One part was rewritten to support the OCI. And in general, it was great because the support from the community came. So when we had a vulnerability or anything else, it was people working on that all over the world. This has been already in production for a year, maybe more. And with that, I'm giving the floor to yeah. Hey, how's the sound? OK, sounds OK. Um, so Garden and CNI. So as a Cloud Foundry operator, um, if you were here for the previous talk, you might have heard about the container networking project. The, this, the Cloud Foundry operator wants to have their containers attached to existing networks. They'd like to have fine-grained network policies between those containers, um, maybe from containers to other things. They might want to utilize advanced features of their software-defined network if they're, they have something like NSXT. Um, and, and as an engineer working on Cloud Foundry and as like a member of the teams that are working on this, we want to avoid reinventing the wheel. We want to enable vendors of, with their fancy technology to add that stuff to Cloud Foundry without us having to do a whole lot of work. And we would like to build our software around open standards. Um, and that's sort of the motivation for um, making use of this CNI project. So this was originally developed by Core OS. It's part of the Rocket project when they were first starting it, but it's now part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, there's a small but growing community, a lot of contributors from different organizations. Um, Pivotal, CoreOS, Red Hat, Tigera, WeaveWorks are all maintainers. Um, and the idea behind it is that it's the simplest possible interface between a container runtime, like Garden, and a network implementation. In practice, this means that the runtime has some configuration that it is provided to it. In Cloud Foundry, that configuration would come from Bosch or Diego. Um, and that config then gets transformed into a certain representation that is understood by the network plugin. And the network plugin then goes and does the hard work of actually setting up the network. And it's that, that first arrow that sort of curves down. That's the CNI boundary. And one thing that's common in CNI plugins, well, OK, before I get there, the, the, the actual thing looks like this. You might have some environment variables that get set that tell the plugin about which container it is and where the network namespace is. And then there's more config that can be passed in over JSON and standard in. So it's a, it's a very sort of simple Unixy format. Um, then you can chain these plugins together. So a common thing is the sort of high level config is passed to the first network plugin, which then delegates to a second network plugin that might be doing IP address management or other things. Um, and so the same param as maybe some new network config gets passed in. And that, that IP address management plugin maybe goes off and talks to a database, talks to DHCP, looks on a file on disk, figures out what IP address to use, and returns that to the main network plugin, which is doing the work of setting up network devices and routing rules and all those sorts of things. Um, the core repo is here. It specifies the API boundary um, for what runtime should do, what plugins should do. Um, it has some conventions for more optional advanced features. And there's a Go language library that makes it easy to implement uh, CNI plugin and to write a runtime that consumes that. 
There's also a separate repo. Uh, we recently split this out into a separate repo, which has a bunch of reference implementations of network plugins. Um, things for interface creation, for IP address management, for sort of tuning and like meta topic things. There's a new port mapping plugin that's pretty cool. Um, and there's a sample if you want to build your own. In addition, there's this big ecosystem out there now. It's not just the reference implementations that we've built into our own, um, into our own repo, but Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes and others are using CNI as container runtimes. And then on the other side of the API boundary, you've got plugins, um, some open source, some proprietary, that tie into various software-defined networking systems. Um, and this is really like where the power of the whole thing comes from. Uh, within Cloud Foundry, we've gotten to, as a result of this work, reduce the size of Garden again. We got to remove a bunch of functionality from Garden Linux, where it was setting up networks itself, and now there's this sort of thin layer that just calls out to CNI, and then the CNI plugin can go and do the hard work. And this, what this lets us do is to swap in various network plugins. Um, what we've pictured here is Silk. If you were at the previous talk, you might have heard about that. It's sort of the batteries included core CNI plugin. It's designed for Cloud Foundry. It's designed to be easy to operate. It's designed to work with Bosch. Um, and it does those things well as a very simple plugin. Um, within Cloud Foundry as a whole, you actually have this whole stack of plugins sort of delegating to each other and calling through API boundaries. Um, you know, Diego is calling the Garden API. Garden Run C has its own little API in order to call this Garden external networker component, which then exposes the CNI API. And then in red on the right, you've got all these swappable CNI plugins that you could tear out these. And if you wanted to, you could put in your own network plugin there. Um, and this is the path towards integrating uh, third-party network solutions into Cloud Foundry. If, you, if you're interested in that, um, you can learn a lot more. Uh, read our docs. There's a link there at the bottom. But the basic idea is you make a Bosch release for your CNI plugin, and then you update your deployment manifest to set some properties. And now Cloud Foundry will deploy with your uh, networking plugin. And uh, this is how we're going to be integrating other, uh, other plugins into Cloud Foundry, which I'll talk about in a second. For the wider CNI community, um, we're going to be, we're sort of polishing up support for IPv6 right now. It's mostly done. We're talking about adding a new verb to the standard. Um, we're talking about adding a conformance test suites so that we can know that plugins are sort of doing the right thing. Um, and then we're going to be doing some release management improvements. Um, in Cloud Foundry, there's going to be more CNI Bosch releases coming out. Uh, Calico, I think, is working on one. VMware is working on one for NSX. Um, this is kind of exciting. So that's the end of the CNI stuff. Right. So um, the last bit is to talk about um, OCI images um, and in Garden. So to start with the definition, what is an OCI image? Um, Constantine has introduced OCI, the Open Container Initiative, before. Um, the OCI images came a bit later. It came around the end of 2015. And uh, it essentially is uh, describing the container image format. It's standardizing the container image format. Um, during the time that OCI images became uh, a thing, uh, there were already two main standards. Uh, you are probably familiar with the Docker image uh, format standard, which uh, has been around for a while, and it's very popular. There are millions of Docker images out there. Uh, and there is also the APC uh, standard uh, coming from CoreOS. Uh, on the other hand, the OCI image standard is not defining distribution, because with Docker, you get the image format, but you also get the distribution mechanism. OCI does not have this as part of its scope. Uh, so we're only talking about how an image looks like, and not how you download an image. Um, in particular, the image is composed of layers, uh, just like a Docker image. And the layers themselves are fully compatible with Docker image layers. Uh, the metadata are fairly different, but uh, there is a, a very well-defined process uh, to convert a Docker image to an OCI image, and also to convert an OCI image into an OCI runtime bundle. Uh, which essentially means that you can get an OCI image and create a container out of it. Uh, to say a few more things about layers, essentially uh, an image layer is a set of files and directories. You can think of it as uh, a diff. And then you're applying all these diffs on top of each other to get an image. Um, if you are familiar with a Docker file, uh, this is a reverse Docker file in which the 
the first line is at the, at the bottom. So you start from a base image, as you uh, may call it. Uh, in this case, it's Python 3.5. And when you, when you say from, you're essentially pulling the layers of this base image into your container image that you're about to create. And then the next line is adding your code, is adding uh, the contents of the current directory to slash my app. This will create another layer, which will contain all these files and directories that compose your code base. And the last line, which is uh, pip install. Pip is a dependency management tool for Python. Um, and it essentially will install all the dependencies of your, in this case, Python application, uh, which, again, will go into a different layer. So all the files and directories pip will download and install will go into a separate layer that will be applied on top of your existing layers. Uh, in terms of metadata, we have a few JSON files. So this is uh, the first one. This is the index.json, which uh, defines uh, uh, an image. And you can have one or more manifests. You can see that this is actually an array. Uh, and a manifest uh, is essentially another JSON file. But every file in OCI image is defined by a content address, uh, a SHA-256 um, content address. So then you have uh, the manifest, which points to a configuration file, another JSON. And it points to a set of layers. Again, we have an array here with a set of layers, uh, which are essentially uh, tarballs. The configuration has its own metadata. So it essentially tells uh, the runtime that this is uh, the architecture, so you can only run it in AMD64, and some metadata, like the environment variables and the command to run when you actually uh, run the container based on this image. So, we would like to reduce guard and run C even further and also use OCI, which is why GridFS became a thing. So it's an image plugin uh, for Garden, and it makes Garden even smaller because it removes the previously built-in file system uh, that Garden was carrying around. So GridFS, um, yeah, just to say a few more things on why we, we did this work. Um, so the previously built-in component is called Garden Sed. You may have heard of it. Uh, it has been largely an implementation detail of Garden Run C. Uh, the problem with Garden Sed is that this code base is now about three years old, and it, it would be really hard to refactor it to add OCI image support. The OCI image support, on the other hand, is very beneficial for us because it unlocks uh, a lot of features. You may have heard of OCI BuildPix, and also treating all different container workloads the same way. Uh, the ones that are buildback based, uh, CF stacks, and the ones that are Docker based, uh, is very beneficial because we can do uh, various optimizations in how we handle containers in Cloud Foundry. So, what is GridFS? Um, it's not a file system, even though its name suggests that it is. Uh, we like to call it a container image management tool, which is not really a term you will find elsewhere. Um, and uh, it's basically uh, a tool that deals with. Uh, the file system isolation of containers, so its container gets its own isolated file system. Um, it deals with casting container images, so you don't have to download the same image twice. And it also deals with disk quotas, because Cloud Foundry has this peculiarity that it cannot really use user disk quotas, because all the containers are using the same VCAP user. So it has to use directory-based quotas for its container. And this is hard. This is very hard. Um, so we had a few iterations. We started using ButterFS, which uh, didn't work very well for uh, the Cloud Foundry scale. Uh, what we ended up with is uh, our current implementation of XFS for these quotas, which has a very mature uh, implementation of uh, directory-based quotas. They call it project quotas. And we also use overlay for layers and for casting these layers. Uh, in terms of adoption and rollout, uh, we have been running GridFS in uh, PWS, the Pivotal Web Services, since uh, April this year, I believe. And it is shipped with PCF 1.12. So we are now looking into uh, making it GA in the open source world. Uh, there is an experimental uh, file for CF deployment, and there is also an experimental flag for uh, Diego release generation, manifest generation scripts. So if you would like to make it a default, if you have any concerns about adopting uh, GridFS in your uh, installation, please come talk to me tomorrow in uh, the GridFS office hours. And with that, I'm going to give you to Gabe, who's going to talk about the future. All right. So with all of these standards, it's pretty great. We get a much smaller garden, and we get a much more extensible Cloud Foundry. Using OCI runtime, we can 
run containers on run C on Linux, win C on Windows, maybe clear containers, maybe other container runners in the future um, because we're complying with that standard. Because we have CNI support in there, um, we can use all these various networking plugins to plug into various software-defined networking solutions, cloud networking solutions and whatnot. And because we have this OCI image thing going, um, we can support all these various types of image um, images, legacy droplets for Cloud Foundry, Docker images, OCI images, next generation build packs, all sorts of other cool stuff. Um, and this is, this is the story of like moving towards standards and making it so we have less code to support. Um, and that's really great. So this, this encourages innovation. It's cross-platform support is much easier. Portability is better and less vendor lock-ins. These are all great things for an open source project. Um, and with that, thank you. And we'll take some questions, if you have any. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't actually um, mention a tool. Uh, there are many tools. For instance, one of them is Scopeo that you could use. Um, what, I, what I try to say, what I try to convey is that there is a defined process, and there's a standard process of doing so. So uh, the implementation, you can find many implementations. Scopeo is the one I would suggest, because that's what we use to convert Docker to OCI. Uh, but yeah, there are more than that. Anything else? Other questions? Cool. Thanks for your time.